Welcome to the I Am HVAC Growth Podcast, where we interview the top leaders in the HVAC industry across North America to understand how they grew their businesses to where they are today. I'm your host, Rob Murray, co-founder and CEO of Intree, a digital marketing agency focused on helping HVAC companies grow. And we're alive. Okay, great. So I uh, welcome everybody to the I Am HVAC Growth Podcast. I have the honor uh, to have our guest, Sandy McLeod, on the show today. Um, seasoned executive, big believer in accountability, uh, strategy, and execution, uh, president and CEO of ATRE, which is uh, the organization um, called the Heating Refrigeration uh, and Air Conditioning Institute of Canada. And so we're really stoked to have you on the show, Sandy. Um, you really kind of bring a really neat perspective, you know, not only from your experience, but also, you know, where you've, where you've worked across the country and kind of have that pan Canada experience. So really excited to, to dive into some of these topics today. Um, maybe you could just give the audience a quick little introduction for yourself of kind of like how you ended up uh, where you are today as CEO and president of HRA. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, thrilled to uh, be having uh, this discussion. So, uh, so as you said, um, I'm leading uh, one of um, Canada's larger uh, trade associations been with uh, HRAI now for um, just over two years, uh, had the um, uh, fortunate uh, opportunity to replace a, a seasoned veteran, Warren Healy, who had been in the job for, for 30 plus years. So uh, I inherited uh, a very uh, well-run and, and healthy uh, association that has been uh, serving uh, this, uh, this sector uh, very well for a long time. Uh, you know, but with any uh, change in leadership, you, you do end up, you know, with a, a, a different viewpoint on, you know, how things uh, might look. Uh, you mentioned uh, my pan-Canadian uh, experience. Uh, I think it was, that was one of the, uh, the factors that uh, led the board to make uh, the choice of me in this role. Uh, I grew up uh, in Atlanta, Canada. I've been fortunate enough to uh, work in the north, uh, lived in Timmins for a couple of years, uh, lived in the prairies, uh, lived in the west coast, uh, and I've been in southern Ontario for, uh, for a number of years. So uh, when you're leading an association like HRAI, uh, it's, it's good to uh, appreciate that this country uh, has uh, a wide mix of issues, uh, in our case, uh, for this business, climate uh, differences. Yeah, big time. Uh, and um, uh, when I travel to uh, different parts of the country, uh, it's been helpful to be able to, when, when you're in Winnipeg at a chapter meeting, for instance, uh, to be able to speak local and, you know, talk about the, the winters that, that I spent uh, in, uh, in Manitoba. Um, and you tend to, you know, talk more about winters there than summers, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great part of the country. I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, there. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, we had a, an opportunity to, to connect uh, before we got on to the, the interview today. Um, and, you know, as much as there was, there's a ton of topics that we can go over. And I think, the, you know, the perspective you have within the HVAC industry is really kind of really, uh, you're in a neat position because you can talk to so many members um, and understanding what the nature of their business. Um, you know, HRA having, I guess, over 1,200 members um, and been established for so long. Uh, but really when it came down to it, we were thinking, you know, this, this topic around strategy and then how it fits into, you know, executing a plan um, really seemed to be a bit of a, you know, a passionate spot for you. And one of the things I thought was really interesting about it uh, was that strategy seems to be a bit of like a, a slippery bowling ball. You know, it's, it's hard to, to grab onto. It can be this abstract idea. Some people think strategic planning is, you know, uh, a, you, you do this annual plan and then you end up parking it on a, on a shelf. It collects dust. You look at it again, a year later and you know hopefully some of it's been done um, and then there's other people around you know that think you know it's all about mission and vision and core values and and I, I really love the way that you kind of brought your perspective to it and I'm, I'm hoping today that we can share with some of the entrepreneurs and leaders out there in the HVAC business um, you know kind of some of your ideas and insights on how strategy is a really key component to growth um, one of the key themes of this podcast is to identify what are the what are the key growth constraints in the HVAC industry within people's businesses, and then what can we do to address them? And strategy is definitely one of them in terms of the people we've talked to. So, can you just start us off by giving us kind of a broad view of of how you define strategy? 
Sure. Um, you know, and, and yes, we did have a, a, a good chat uh, about uh, uh, the nuances of strategy. And, and you're right. I think a lot of people figure if you're not, you know, the size of a Coca-Cola or if you're not in an emerging business like, you know, a Google uh, strategy is, you know, not something you need to worry about. And uh, here at HRAI, we're, you know, we're a small business or a medium-sized business. Uh, and even though we're a trade association, at the end of the day, uh, we have the same issues that every other business has to deal with. And you've got people issues and you've got revenue to worry about. And God forbid whoever saw COVID uh, over the horizon. But uh, having a strategy uh, during times of crisis is actually helpful. And, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, mission and vision. And, and I think that's sometimes when people's eyes begin to roll and what's the difference between the two and God, I'm an entrepreneur and that's, you know, that's not where I'm going to go. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a real believer uh, in simplicity. And, you know, if, if mission and vision and that process and exercise, you know, is not uh, someone's passion, uh, I think it can be parked. I uh, don't think it necessarily needs to be the driving force uh, behind uh, your strategy. Let's call it optional. What I think isn't optional uh, is understanding what your strategic priorities are. And I don't think that matters uh, whether you're a three-man shop uh, or a 3,000 person company. Uh, trying to figure out what are the broad strategic priorities that are important to your organization uh, is, is where the, the formation of strategy begins. And I think, you know, one of the things uh, about strategy that people often forget uh, strategy helps you determine what not to do as much as what to do. Uh, we see, uh, you know, one of the neat things in, in this association is, as you mentioned, we have 1,200 members, uh, and we have everything from that three-person uh, shop that is very independent and very nimble, uh, all the way up to multinational companies uh, like Johnson Controls and Lean and others uh, that are huge. Uh, so, you know, I have the opportunity in, in any given day uh, to have this conversation with small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses. And I think what you find often with the successful companies is they know what business they're in. And, and again, they know what business they're not in because often it's easy to say, I'm going to add another line or I'm going to get into this particular uh, line of business or customer segment. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you find you're, you're um, splitting your efforts in a way that you're actually not all that effective. So, you know, back to, to that issue of, you know, figuring out what your key priorities are, um, I think is important. And uh, they don't need to be, uh, you know, really all that difficult. Um, I think, again, you know, sometimes people, uh, you know, get into this sense of, you know, what do you mean by strategic priorities? Well, here at HRAI, uh, we've got a handful of them. And uh, one of the things that we found very quickly, and this was from uh, uh, listening to our, our members, and, and in some cases, in my case, it's members, your, your case, it's, uh, it's customers. Um, so they're, they're interchangeable. So when I talk about members in this podcast, uh, I think you should, uh, for the listeners, think about your customer base. And one of the very first things we did uh, here is we surveyed our customer base about, you know, what is the value proposition? What do you expect from, from this association? And very clearly, uh, we heard that um, government relations is a key issue for our membership base. And when we um, uh, uh, unpeeled the onion a little bit and got behind that, we also found uh, that uh, keen issue on the environment. So energy efficiency, climate change, uh, the changing role of refrigerants in this country. So, they're, they're, so our environmental uh, focus and government relations is pr pretty much kind of our number one strategic priority. Uh, number two uh, is member engagement. So you know, it's important with 1,200 members to figure out how we're going to connect with them, uh, what type of uh, 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 tools that we need to use. We, we used to have a lot of chapter meetings, and again, I mentioned this COVID thing that happened a few months ago. Uh, we've definitely been uh, having to, uh, to adjust our, our thinking on that front, uh, which brings me to number three, which is communication. Uh, and, you know, our members look to us to keep 
them abreast uh, of what's happening in this industry. Um, you know, whether it's technology, uh, back to the government relations issues, what's breaking on that front. Uh, and that's getting even more complicated in this country because, you know, we've got federal issues, we've got provincial issues. Uh, and now you've got municipalities kind of getting uh, into the game uh, with locations like the city of Vancouver uh, crafting their own climate change plans right. uh, that make uh, communications uh, pretty important. Uh, and then pillar four for us uh, is education. So we do a lot of post trades training, a uh, big chunk of our business, uh, a very important uh, chunk of our business for, um, for, our, for the membership. So, so those kind of tend to be uh, our four pillars. And then the fifth one, which we um, simply uh, call business fundamentals, uh, and this is what you know, almost every business has to deal with, and that's the issue with keeping the lights on. You know, like all the things that you have to do uh, to make sure your business functions. So, so I'd say we have four uh, pillars that are around meeting the needs of our members, and then the fifth one is just making sure that all of those um, chunks and pieces uh, essentially work. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, there's a lot to un unpack there, but one of the big takeaways I love about how you just went through that, to your point at the beginning, is this, these, this isn't rocket science type of stuff. You know, you, you're asking the stakeholders that are paying you money what value they expect from your business, uh, in this case, your association, and then responding by making their, you know, the largest amount of feedback, your number one strategic priority. And then, I mean, we'll, we'll get into it in a minute about how you actually execute on these strategies because, you know, just words on a, on a piece of paper or a wall actually don't do much. So how are we actually going to put teeth into these things? Um, but what I love about it is, you know, it, the process of trying to identify um, what the strategic priorities are isn't that difficult. And I love that you're going, you know, member first or, or customer first in terms of orienting what those priorities look like. So I think that was really neat. The, the one thing I, I really liked about what you're saying too, about how strategy helps you not only figure out what to do, but what not to do. Um, so often we'll be talking to our clients and they'll be saying like, oh yeah, no, we're in business to business. We're in business to consumer. We work with the end users. We do new, new home builds. We work with contractors. We do institutional. It's just like, whoa. And like, we do something for everyone. And then to your point, they're spread so thin, they don't do anything really well for anyone. So really trying to get into that uh, key area of focus has been, I think, one of the biggest things that have helped clients, you know, grow their business successfully without having to just keep pushing like a boulder up a mountain. Um, and then the idea around this um, centralized news resource or resource to, to position HRAI uh, as, as the trusted advisor in the industry to keep all your members abreast of what's going on, whether it's government relations, whether it's, you know, COVID-19, whether it's um, what's new in the world of, you know, marketing and sales or training. Um, I think a lot of businesses sometimes miss out on the fact that their customers want more from them than just the transaction. And so helping people understand like what's in their home uh, you know, I was having this conversation with uh, uh, Jason uh, from DC Air. It was another uh, podcast we did. And he was talking about MERV ratings and furnace filters and like how uh, it's, it's indoor air quality is definitely a hot topic right now. Um, and But he was saying that, you know, your lungs uh, filter at a MERV 4 rating. And so like, the, you know, if you're putting a MERV 4 filter into your furnace, it's really not doing much for you as a person. Um, so like helping people understand what this stuff is all about. Uh, is really, really important for any HVAC business because it's really technical, right? You know, not every homeowner is going to have a clear understanding of what's in their house. Um, so I just think the way that you've positioned that can really help people. To your point, they don't necessarily have members, they have customers, but it translates so well. Um, the, the quick question for you, though, when you were bringing this up, um, and I thought it was really neat about, you know, government relations and environment. Um, one of the kind of themes that have been coming up around um, more energy efficient homes and, and technologies um, and what might make it happen faster is the idea of government regulation pushing the industry into newer technology. Do you have any insight on what's kind of being talked about right now or what you kind of see coming in the next year or two or three? Um, so we spend a lot of time and effort on that very issue. Uh, and, you know, I wish it was as simple um, as a, a, a one bucket answer of that, that question. One of the things that we find in this country uh, is because of our size, we have different climate zones. 
And, you know, it's, it's interesting if you look at, you know, Atlantic Canada, for instance, um, the transition to heat pumps uh, is explosive. And uh, it's explosive because they don't have natural gas or any, in any great way. I mean, there's pockets of natural gas in Atlantic Canada. Uh, but it, it's not like, you know, Southern Ontario, uh, where it's here, it's cheap, it's easy to access, uh, and has a history. Um, so it's interesting in Atlantic Canada, this transition um, is happening to uh, something that's more environmentally friendly without a lot of government intervention. So, uh, so if you, you know, you look at Nova Scotia Power, they have some pretty good uh, financing plans for people to make the purchase easy. Uh, and that's, that's great, uh, but there's not been in recent times uh, a lot of incentives to drive people to do so, um, you know, mostly because it, it, it makes sense to do it. So, you know, when you need to replace a dirty old gas, or sorry, oil furnace, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden the, this, the, the neat heat pump uh, looks to, uh, to be helpful. And then it's funny, you layer on top of that, I grew up in Atlanta, Canada, and, and when I was a kid, uh, air conditioning was non-existent. Um, okay. you, know, you just didn't need it there. Uh, you maybe had two days a year where it got to 30 degrees, and you know most of the summer was 22, 23, 24, and, and cooling down in, into the mid-teens at night. Well, that's changed. Uh, you know, so now all of a sudden, uh, a heat pump can offer uh, heat in the winter uh, and can offer um, cooling uh, in the summer. And what's also interesting about Atlantic Canada, uh, when you look at uh, kind of heating needs, heating and cooling needs, their climate is very similar to BC. So, you know, while Vancouver uh, will hover in the winter at say plus three to plus five, you know, Halifax might be minus five to plus five. So, you know, everyone thinks it's that much colder, they get a lot of snow, the weather's more aggressive. But in our world, a heat pump meets that need fairly effectively. Still lots of debate in places like Alberta, uh, whether heat pumps in isolation uh, will um, be able to uh, meet that need. Uh, and then also you've got the issue in uh, both Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, of a super abundance uh, of natural gas and a heavy reliance on natural gas to their economy. So I, I guess it's a bit of a long answer to your question, but I, I think this is going to play out differently uh, in different regions. Um, you know, I think uh, geothermal is something that, um, you know, has lots of environmental benefits, but it's super expensive for the end user. So, you know, you're starting to see that uh, play out in um, uh, commercial uh, applications because they're looking at longer windows. Uh, but I was speaking to a friend of mine uh, who's in Atlanta, Canada, and he just recently had heat pumps installed in his house. And uh, when I asked him the question about geothermal, he, he looked at it, he just couldn't justify the cost of it. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's going to be uh, all kinds of uh, different uh, ways this will play out. The, um, you know, the, the funding or the financing that you're seeing right now in Atlanta, Canada, uh, Green On, when it was running here in Ontario, uh, had uh, pretty significant incentives uh, available for, uh, for conversions. I think the, the real issue is going to be at the end of this financial mess that we're in right now, um, does the government have any money? Yeah. And I'm going to take that as a rhetorical question because I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true though, right? So I mean, to, to see how you can incentivize the end user is going to be an interesting thing over the next five years. So, um, Very but, much. but still the idea that there's going to be different, um, you know, timing solutions, regulations based on different regions makes a lot of sense. And, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, we are continuously hearing from government that climate change, energy efficiency, uh, lower carbon emissions, uh, all of those things, um, you know, are going to uh, absolutely be on their agenda. I think the whole COVID thing uh, is, is kind of sidetracked it, derailed it a little bit, uh, but this will come back. Uh, warring pretty pretty aggressively uh, when some level of normalcy uh, begins to kind of uh, come back into uh, into play. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, circling back then to this idea of strategy and execution, you talked about your four pillars. Um, you mentioned the idea of you know advocacy and the environment, um, member value or member engagement, 
communication, education, and then the, the fifth one was kind of like all encompassing the rest to make sure they work properly in terms of business fundamentals. Um, when, when you have defined those strategic priorities and, you're, and, and for the sake of our listeners and viewers, um, what, what is the first step to bringing them to life? So, you know, I think um, one of the things that is, uh, you know, pretty important inside of each of those uh, five uh, pillars is trying to figure out uh, where you'd like to be in each of them in a period of time. So, and I think um, it, in, in a perfect world, you try and figure out about, you know, what are some of the uh, situations that I'd like to see my company be in in three to five years. So are you looking to grow? Are you looking to position as you know, an expert in climate change? Uh, is there a certain segment of the market that you hope to penetrate? Um, and if you have access to data, uh, things like market penetration, those types of things, those are always helpful. So it, it's kind of setting uh, in each of those four pillars uh, what that looks like. So for us, for instance, with membership, um, we uh, have set a fairly lofty uh, goal. We've got 1,200 members today. We would like to be, um, and again, this was done kind of pre-COVID, we're readjusting some of our uh, expectations. I think it'd be more the timeline than the goal itself. I think what I thought was going to happen in two years is going to maybe take five to, to realize. But we'd set some goals around, uh, we would like to be able to say we represent 2,000 companies in Canada that have um, sales in this country of over uh, $10 billion and who employ more than 100,000 people. And the reason those numbers are important is because it brings us right back to the government relations discussion. We now have clout in Canada. So if we have those types of numbers, so when we're sitting down with government, whether it's at the provincial level or the federal level, they've got to give you a seat at the table because all of a sudden your size is so important to the Canadian economy that that they're willing to have that discussion. And, you know, when I talk about uh, representing 2000 companies, you'll notice I didn't say have 2000 members. I think part of that can be done uh, in partnership. And I think that's one of the other things with, uh, with business that often people forget is sometimes you can partner with other like-minded businesses uh, and pool resources to actually help you meet common goals. Uh, we've struck two of those deals uh, in the past year uh, that have um, both strengthened us financially and also given us more clout with government. The first one uh, was with ORAC, um, so they're based here in Ontario, uh, and they tend to represent uh, large commercial uh, contractors in the, in the refrigeration space. So we've actually joined forces. We now represent them um, with, uh, with government. Uh, we jointly have worked on a number of initiatives. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, their members become our members when we're talking to government. Uh, we held a session at um, Queen's Park uh, back uh, earlier this year, uh, and they joined us. So it was a joint effort. We both went in together. We had a common agenda, uh, and we were able to have that discussion. Uh, awesome. And another similar thing uh, with our counterpart uh, in the U.S., AHRI, uh, who represent uh, most of the global manufacturers of HVAC and refrigeration equipment, um, and uh, we are uh, we have now jointly between the two of us uh, funded a government relations person uh, in Ottawa that is dealing with harmonization issues. So as much as possible, trying to make sure that the rules, the regulations, the guidelines, the equipment uh, is harmonized as much as possible across our provinces and with the U.S. Uh, awesome. That makes it easier for um, you know uh, contractors. Um, to have simplicity um, uh, as far as what the installation uh, guidelines look like, what the products look like. Uh, one of the things that we often push government on is if you push a product too far and you're, you're ahead of the rest of the market, and this tends to happen in Canada, in British Columbia and Quebec and in, in the US and California, all of a sudden the contractors can't find supply. So, you know, manufacturers are not keen on having to build equipment that is only going to be for sale uh, in a segment of a global market when, when they're, they're global players. So, yeah. you know, those are some of the kind of uh, basics of making sure you get those um, macro objectives in place and they link your strategy together. So, um, you know, I was talking about the, the, that 2000 number, 
it played right back into my government relations strategy. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think, you know, um, th that creates a compounding effect in terms of the utilization of resources, whether it's money, people, time, all the above. If you're, if you're, you know, if you, if you have the opportunity to make it so that your strategic pillars are intertwined, anytime you lean on one of them, all of them are being impacted. Um, I think that's a really cool takeaway because I think it's really easy to identify important stuff. Um, sometimes it's more difficult to identify what the most important stuff is. But if you can do so in a way that keeps everything um, intertwined, that can be really uh, powerful as you're working on your strategy. So I really appreciate that, that perspective. I think that's a really cool takeaway um, that anybody, I mean, I, I study strategy pretty, <laughs> for a long time um, and uh, I've never heard anybody articulate that idea specifically. So I really, really appreciate you sharing that, Sandy. Oh, cool. No, it's quite good. Um, so I, you know, we don't have a ton of time here, but I really want to get into this idea, this crazy phenomenon that, you know, not everybody focuses on, um, but this thing you call profitability. And, um, you know, I think there's a really cool saying, right? Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. And one of the biggest things that we can be doing right now um, with regard to, you know, getting ready for the future, whatever it brings, is, is operating in a profitable fashion to help build our cash. You know, I was talking to somebody about, you know, what's, what's your plan B? And they asked me, what, what's your plan B if there's another lockdown? Um, if this COVID thing really stretches out and the economy gets hit really hard? Um, I said, well, I said, it's really simple. Actually, it's just cash. Because if you have the best idea, the best business, the best leadership, the best team, and you have no cash, well, you're done. And, and the biggest way for us to, to do that is to run as profitably as possible while supporting our team and our customers. So can you just give us a, a, a rundown from your perspective of like profitability uh, when it relates to HVAC companies and maybe one or two things that uh, an entrepreneur or HVAC leader should be looking at to ensure they are running their company profitably? Um, so I, I think your opening statement of, um, you know, you said cash, I, I might say operational effectiveness, but I think we're kind of saying the same thing that you should never be uh, fat in your organization. So uh, I think no matter what business you're in, it's always uh, healthy uh, to be trying to squeeze out the most effective margin you can uh, because you need cash for these peaks and valleys. And, and there's going to be opportunities when you're going to want to invest. And that might even be a good time. It doesn't mean that you're always necessarily, uh, you know, trying to squirrel away uh, dollars for horrific events that might come at you. Uh, but having, um, somebody once asked me, uh, you know, what do you, you know, what do you think of money? What, what does it do from a business perspective? Um, and I think I, my answer was flexibility. It, it just, it gives the business the opportunity, uh, to, uh, deal with issues, uh, as they need to. Um, so, uh, a couple of your, uh, or you, you asked for a couple of, um, tangibles. So, you know, I think um, acting quickly is always uh, something that uh, organizations uh, should be uh, uh, focused on. And, and I'll just even go back to COVID-19. Uh, when this started coming down, uh, we had CMPX uh, scheduled for uh, late March and we the, the rug was pulled on March 13th. Uh, by a week later, uh, I had a revised plan in front of the board uh, on what we needed to do. And, and there were some harsh things we needed to do. We reduced our staff by a third. Uh, we had to uh, readjust uh, our thinking on a bunch of initiatives that we had planned and, and scale that back. So I've got, that also goes back. It's helpful to have a strategy because we were able to go back and adjust the strategy pretty quickly. Uh, and by March 27th, we had this stuff all executed. So, the ability to move quick is, uh, is important, um, especially for small businesses. Um, we are going to be launching in the coming weeks uh, a series, uh, a webinar series uh, called Improving Your Profitability. Uh, and uh, one of the um, uh, first ones up, as a matter of fact, I've got a conference call with them tomorrow, uh, is about pricing. So there, there's another one that I think um, so many small businesses uh, basically do their pricing from a cost standpoint. So they figure out their costs and then they figure out, I want to make a margin of X on that particular line of business. 
and I apply that same margin uh, across everything I do. And, you know, even again with, with small businesses, there's, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to think differently about pricing. So that, you know, stuff that's really commodity maybe needs to have a lower margin uh, than some of the stuff that's, that's more specialized. Even the geographics of where you're doing the work, certain postal codes may be less price sensitive than other types of postal codes. Uh, what products are bought in combination? So, you know, when you actually buy a certain uh, product, uh, this is even wholesalers can be thinking this way, uh, what other products are sold with it? So maybe you sell the first product at a lower margin than the, the subsequent products. Uh, you know, what do you think about your pricing from an inflationary standpoint every year? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's amazing um, how a lot of organizations think maintaining their pricing at, you know, $1,000 for a particular job over five years, you know, is benefiting their customers. They'd be much better off to put a 2 two or 3% increase on every year so that when you actually have a year like this year, COVID, this is a year you freeze your pricing. So, yeah. you know, now all of a sudden you've got, you know, potentially uh, uh, pressures that, you know, people don't have the funds, et cetera. You know, being able to go out to your customer base and say you've held your prices this year actually gives you a, a, a PR or a marketing uh, kind of opportunity. Um, don't lose sight. Uh, and the third one, I guess I would say uh, for small businesses to be thinking about uh, profitability, um, don't lose sight of your employees. Um, you know, it is so important that, the people on staff understand your business, that they're effective. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, strategy earlier, and Rob, I'll even ask you this question. When you bring a new employee uh, into Intrigue Media, do you personally as the CEO sit down with them and actually go through what's important to the company, what the strategy is, and what your objectives are for the next year? Yeah, I don't do it right away though. Uh, we have an- In 90 days? Oh yeah, 100%. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, we have like a, a profile assessment tool that I debrief with them and then provide them an overlay of we call our intrigues roadmap. Yep. Um, but uh, after our last call, um, and we've hired some folks, uh, I've compressed the time from when they join uh, to when we have our conversation. So I, 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 that was a takeaway that I took uh, pretty seriously. I appreciate you sharing. But a lot of companies don't do that, right? You know, they, they hire somebody they, you know, they hire Bob, let him sit with Mary Jane and they sit down and they, they train and they, they learn from each other and the person picks up the good and the bad from the old employee that's leaving. Uh, and then no one ever sits down and tries to actually um, explain the four pillars to them and what it is we're trying to accomplish uh, and, uh, and share KPIs with employees. It's another thing that I think so many companies, uh, the only people that actually look at the KPIs uh, you know, is the owner and the CFO and, you know, maybe someone else. And 95% of the KPIs are financial KPIs. And financial KPIs are important, but I'm just as interested in knowing what my satisfaction level is with my members, you know, as I am, what's my revenue per member. They're, they're equally important. Uh, and, uh, and often that's just kind of lost uh, in the mix. So, so that element of the employee and having uh, the tools and the information with your staff so they know how the business is doing is another one of those kind of critical investments. I love it. Sandy, there's so many people that uh, I've worked with, talked to, experienced that um, don't have that quite figured out, um, whether they've tried or not. I think that one of the biggest things for us, I mean, we're an open book business, so we just had a team lunch today. We do a full transparent review of our financial situation. Um, our bonus program is based on profitability and we update everybody uh, monthly on that. Um, we have a scoreboard for every team member that is publicly accessible. I mean, it's not so much right now because it's, it's, we're not in the office anymore. Um, and so everybody can, sees, can see where they're at. Everybody's got KPIs. But I think, um, so one of the best books that really kind of got me into that um, thinking well was The Great Game of Business. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. Um, but it, one of the, the biggest lessons from that book for me was that if you start to financially uh, orient your team and, and get them really understanding what's under the hood of the business and, and how their behaviors impact financial results. Don't expect it to be a 90 minute meeting and then they got it. Um, and, and I think sometimes owners get frustrated because uh, their team doesn't necessarily see things the way they see things. Um, but it, I think it's a natural dynamic that has to be worked on over a long period of time. 
you know, we've done financial updates with cash flow statements, balance sheets, and revenue statements. And there's some folks uh, that are part of our team that have seen probably 50 of those types of updates and still don't quite have a full grasp of, you know, the, the impact of how our numbers are, are coming to life in a day-to-day operation. And that's okay. I think that's the, the kicker though. But the one thing I have gotten from all of it though is just the sheer value of sharing, whether people fully get it or not, doesn't matter. It brings people together and it makes them feel like they're part of it. And when, when things are bad, everybody knows about it. And when things are good, everybody knows about it. And I think some owners kind of get worried that if they tell people that it's, you know, shaky, it's a shaky situation, they're going to get nervous, maybe look for new jobs or get scared. And that may or may not be true. But one of the things we've seen is that people actually band together and they start to pull harder right. um, and they start to support each other. And, and when times are good, uh, yeah, you know what, as an owner, if, I mean, if, when, when times are good, we have to share, you know, so we're not going to be like, Hey, we just crushed it. Thanks everybody. Pat on the back. Have a great day. You know, it's like, no, let's, if we're doing a great job, let's share the wealth. And one of the concepts that came from um, the great game of business was this idea of uh, generate wealth and distribute wealth. Um, and I just, I love that idea. And he just struck a chord with me at the end there, Sandy. So I really appreciate that. It's interesting, just when you were talking about uh, those various pieces, um, you touched upon a couple of things that I think are so critical inside, um, especially medium-sized companies. Um, And one is transparency. So share as much as you can. Um, Don't hold secrets back from staff, because if you hold some secrets back, they're they're gonna just not trust you. And And I think it's important to be as honest and transparent as possible. Uh, you touched on collaboration or teamwork, pulling together. I think that's another thing. Anything we can do uh, inside our organizations to ensure that we've got that level of collaboration um, is uh, is critical. Um, and uh, and accountability is key. Uh, and that starts with people like you and I. Uh, we need to do what we say we're going to do. Uh, we need to do it on time. Uh, and you know, be very accountable. Never take the oh well, I you know, miss that because it rained yesterday or it snowed yesterday or whatever happened, um, you know, just own it. And, you know, if you miss something, uh, you know, just do a reset, take it on, don't blame anybody uh, and, uh, and move forward. And, and the other thing, and you, you touched upon this earlier about, the, you know, people see data over and over again, learning and curiosity is so important in today's environment. And, you know, one of the things that we've done here as part of our, uh, Uh, employee growth program is we encourage every employee uh, to do 40 hours of learning in a year and they're actually supposed to sit down with their manager and have a learning plan uh, for that next year and we're very broad in what learning means because I I personally believe you know you don't necessarily have to learn to be an accountant uh, but anything you do to get your mind moving uh, will actually improve your critical thinking so when we launched that, I made a commitment to my staff uh, that I was going to um, start uh, learning Spanish. And I do a Spanish lesson every day for 10 minutes. Uh, I, and now I know lots of Spanish words. I still just can't really put them together. But uh, yeah. eventually that will come. So. Yo hablo espanol poquito. Poquito, yeah. That's Senor, great. Si. Gracias. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate I mean, I, honestly, I could be doing this for the next half an hour easy, maybe even longer, Sandy. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, you'd be open to coming on the show again, because I think this was, this was good. It was it's just, it's an interesting conversation to have. Yeah, big time. And I, I just think your perspective is uh, really important for people to hear. And that's the whole purpose of this thing is to help share insights and let people kind of grab on what they want to grab on so they can start implementing some of their own best practices, because um, there's just not a lot of resources like this right now. No, that's so I'm true. Just, I'm really appreciated that, uh, appreciative that you, you decided to join our call. Um, so just a quick one in terms of takeaways. What I, um, the idea of intertwined strategic priorities, I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, when you define you know, four or five pillars or three or whatever it is, um, seeing if there's opportunities to make it so that they're intertwined so that no matter what lever you're pushing, they're all being impacted. I just think that's a really cool takeaway. And what you were saying before about profitability tied to pricing, so many people need to understand that and you know the idea it's not just cost that dictates pricing whether it's geography difficulty of the job different product lines um you know i think there's a lot more strategic orientations yeah absolutely and inflationary uh, raising of prices year over year is super important um 
so I just, yeah, I think there's a lot of takeaways here for people and I just hope they get, you know, half the value I got from it. I really do appreciate you doing this. Um, I think that's, that's it for today's episode cool. of I am uh, HVAC growth podcast. And thanks again, Sandy, for being a part of it. Excellent. Thank you for having me.